All right, Kyle Brandt, we've done some good ones over the years. We've done some oh, yeah. Stallone, some Schwarzenegger, some Van Damme, Van Dam, mm-hmm. Von Dam. Van Dam. Van Dam, Von yep. Dam. <laughs> we've done some Wheaton. Yep. And now our second Seagal film. And yes. this is the best one he ever did. I'm just going to read you the Amazon description. A band of ruthless mercenaries plots to hijack a ship and hold the world at ransom. They've thought of everything except the ship's cook, former Navy SEAL, Casey Rybeck. And we're off. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm glad we're off too, Bill, because we got to do this snappy today. I got some pies in the oven and I got to make a 50 gallons of Bula base. So let's get cracking. Um, We did do Hard to Kill. And Hard to Kill is a stupid, ridiculous movie that we love. Under Siege is a real movie with a real director, real production value, a real supporting cast. I think it's the best shape that Seagal was ever in physically for a movie. You have these like- And, and he's still a C minus for he's being in shape. C minus. Go, yeah. It's, it's a gut, but he has at least arms. It's a C minus, but it's like an A for him. And like the movie ends- with one of our greatest actors, a Harvard-educated thespian, having a knife fight with the guy who played Mason Storm. It's nuts, and it's awesome. <laughs> I wrote down, well, first of all, Seagal's in this movie for 41 minutes total. Talk and the it. director, Andrew Davis, who had a really nice career, and we'll, we'll go through that later, but yeah. this, this ends up with him getting The Fugitive, where he pulls Tommy Lee Jones back. And he basically admits after, like, it really wasn't about Seagal for me. At our, I had already worked with Seagal. I really wanted to work with Tommy Lee Jones. He's mm-hmm. unabashed about it. Um, with that said, Seagal's on a heater right now. Yeah. Above the law, hard to kill, marked for death, and out for justice. The uh, quadrilogy of three-word titles, which we covered in the last one. And then under siege. He's five for five at this point. Yeah. I don't even know what, what football player is he. See, this is like Earl Campbell. Like, who is this? Just coming out of the gates with all pro seasons. Yeah. I mean, it's it's that or it's just like, it's it's Mahomes. Like, you had the one year kind of sitting on the bench for right. Alex Smith. And that that was that was above the law. I was fine. But then you get the field and you're like, damn, this guy just has it. Why didn't we start him from the get-go? And I'm looking at it too, Bill, because this is, you talked about this for years. In this year, 92, it's a real interesting year for action stars. And it almost feels like for a second that, that Seagal has the belt. Because the other heavy hitters, like, I, I have the breakdown. Like, So Arnold in 91, he does Terminator 2 and like owns the world, right? Yeah. But Arnold takes off for 92, off for 93, and he doesn't come back till 94 with Last Action Hero. Sly is, is scraping badly. It's Oscar, which is the worst movie ever made. It's Throw Mama from the Train or Stop or My Mom Will Shoot. And then Van Damme is doing some stuff that's just fine, but nothing like this. I feel like for 92, for a hot minute, Seagal was the guy among guys. And it's amazing. It's a great point. I'm looking at my uh, my Grantland. I did the action yeah, championship yeah, yeah. belt. And you're right. I, I gave it to Clint Eastwood for Unforgiven in 92. Mm, the senior tour. Yeah. It, it was kind of like the George Foreman coming back and winning the heavyweight title again. But I did write, and we didn't, I didn't even know you were new to this. I wrote, biggest challenger, the Seagal era crested with the delightfully mindless under siege, or as it's better known, die hard on a boat, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. You can't deny Seagal's 1990 to 92 run. Um, this is this is as close as he got. And really, yeah. like he probably is telling people that he did have the belt. I don't think he probably took Unforgiven seriously. I You mentioned the Mahomes piece. Yeah. I would argue the sitting on the bench for the season was when he was like Mike Ovitz's jujitsu instructor or whatever the hell he was <laughs> before yeah, he right. made movies. Because <laughs> that was the year he learned the offense and uh, and he got everything going. Um, there's so much to love about Seagal in this. I wrote, first of all, they're trying to make it like he's kind of funny and wisecracky. Yep. I don't know. This is like, a, we're in kind of a Seinfeld era right now. We're in the, Stallone has been trying to do this a few times. Mm-hmm. I wrote that he's basically like Anthony Bohr Van Dam, Anthony Bohr Dam. I don't know. I don't know what. That's good. We, we, we'd want it. He, it's a gregarious Seagal, and yet every time he tells a joke, there's no joke. I know. 
It's just like it, like if he was on this pod right now and, and Craig, the producer, came in and he'd be like, hey, Craig, look at this guy. Is that a Zoom? And everybody's just laughing hysterically. <laughs> <laughs> just It's a cut to 20 people, like almost killed over. But he never actually tells a joke. Did you notice that? I did. And I think you're tapping into something that in all of his movies, this is Seagal really trying to be a character. He's not just a cop who's cleaning up the streets in Brooklyn. He has a backstory, he has a trade, he's a chef. And, and also they try really hard in the first 10 minutes of the movie with all the nonsense you're talking about to make it seem like everyone likes Seagal. And it's yeah. funny to watch now because you know everyone on the set hates him, including the director <laughs> and the crew. But they're like, hey, ride back and show us a move. Let's dance. But he never actually, like, when he busts people's balls, the closest he comes to making a joke is the worst joke ever. When he's like, we're with you another week, right back. He's like, well, I guess I'll get to see you hit puberty. And they're like, oh, oh. it's really bad. He's like Bertie Mac at the Apollo. Yeah, yeah they have, he, he says that. And then uh, he, th th I wrote basically that first scene when he's cooking for everyone. It's yeah. basically the premise for season one of The Bear. Uh huh. It's it's the guy in the middle of everything who's just, just this, Crazy talent. I sent you, there's this scene when Tommy Lee goes over the, uh, when the microwave blows up. Yeah. Tommy Lee goes over the counter. And for a split second, we see this whole menu. And there's like 19 things in the menu. And it's all these goofy, like, uh, like th these names that are tied to Casey or Ryback. Yeah. Number one is Casey's Kimchi. There's Kung Pao Chase Casey. Mm -hmm. Senior Ryback's Green Chili. There's Pasta Rubacchiano. Um, they're just doing everything they can to make him a personality, and yet Seagal has no personality. And doesn't it work in the sense that that's exactly what Seagal would do if he was a chef? He'd name every dish after himself. <laughs> he, he's not a battleship. You, why don't you name it after some of the great admirals and generals and or soldiers? Every recipe is about him. It's, again, like George Foreman, who named every one of his sons George, just so they could have <laughs> right. the same name. Casey, why don't you show respect to some of the great leaders? No, they're all about me. <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> there's some of the stuff that he made. First of all, there's El Paso Chili. Yep. Can't think of anything worse on a boat than chili. There's Cajun Gumbo and Boston Clam Chowder. He's got oysters for some reason. It says mm -hmm. Pompa's Oysters. Yeah. Um, there's Suckling Pig from New Guinea. Mm-hmm. And pad thai. It's like, I don't know what what kind of shit. How about burgers and fries, Casey? Yeah. Hey, how about chicken, chicken fingers? And broccoli. Uh, enough with the gumbo and the chili <laughs> and the thing that has self contained plumbing. We're out at sea, <laughs> my friends. Yeah, it's a lot. Um, I do think if he had stayed this likable or as likable as he could get, yeah. uh, he's probably the best action movie star of the 90s. It's mm -hmm. just like it goes sideways after this because this movie is successful it eventually leads to him wanting to do On Deadly Ground, which is yeah. one of the funniest action movies anyone's ever made, where he's he's trying to make social statements because he's Steven Seagal, but then agrees to do Under Siege 2 yep. if they let him direct On Deadly Ground. This guy was doing jiu-jitsu with Mike Ovitz like nine mm -hmm. years earlier. Now he's mm -hmm. going to direct movies. And that's when it goes sideways. But I still really appreciate this 90 to 92 run. I, I always wonder... For people like for for our guy Craig or everybody listening who's younger, like, do they listen to this? And they're like, Seagal, he's that dipshit clown on the internet who's fat <laughs> with a beard. I think we have to remind people. Yeah. Right. So the Seagal deal, let's just have the disclaimer. Like his reputation at this point is at best highly troubling, and at worst, he's a reprehensible human being. But in the 90s, I'm telling you. He was different, he talked different, he looked different, he was built different, and it was all these meatheads like Schwarzenegger and Stallone that we loved, but like, Seagal was very cool, and you couldn't take your eyes off him, and it was just, it was a thing for like five or six years that I promised was cool before it went dark. It's kind of like how the Red Sox feel about, two, Red Sox fans about 2004 and Kurt Schilling. <laughs> like, I swear to God, man, you had to be there. The bloody sock was amazing. The guy was awesome. Um, it was a big enough deal when Seagal, like for this movie, he shaved, he, he cut his ponytail. Huge. Because in the military, somehow didn't have to shave his head, but they did have to cut the ponytail. There's a lot of weird haircut stuff in this movie for, you know, for, for the military. You, yeah. you would never know it from half the actors. We have some picking nits on that for sure. But there's two things that he doesn't do in this movie that at this point, Bill, this is his signature. When you go to a Seagal movie, 
He's going to have the ponytail, and at some point, he's going to snap someone's arm over his shoulder. It's just what he did, and is like, it's like when Van Damme would do the splits. That's why you're there. He doesn't do it, and I feel like it was a little bit like Arnold not saying, I'll be back in a movie. Like, I, I've moved uh, past that now. I'm not going to do the catchphrase. Yeah, he zagged. Um, yeah. He didn't zag from this thing, though, Kyle Brent. Go on. Nobody lands a punch on him the whole movie. Let's Again, go. I, I, it's just... Part of the Seagal thing, I think, was like, I have to be way more dominant and way more alpha than everybody else. So nobody's even allowed to to graze me with a right hook, much less kick me, much less me fall backwards, nothing. Each fight, it's just a 10-7 round. But this is the Seagal trademark. Do you think he went into these movies? He's like, I'm not, just so you know, uh, I have to win every fight convincingly. Yeah. And that, that's it. Even Tommy Lee can't land anything on him. No. And listen, I, I've felt this way for years. This makes my blood boil. I think it's contractual. I think it is written expressly oh. that Mr. Seagal will not only win every fight, he will not take damage. And it's important to remember the context. Stallone's fights, he gets the shit kicked out of him by Drago, by the guy. Yeah. John Lithgow's beating him up in Cliffhanger. It doesn't mean it makes sense. Van Damme, destroyed. And then they make the comeback. Seagal, not only does not lose, he doesn't take one blow, and Billy's usually fighting four people at one time, and it's almost like the only way to fight Seagal is, we're gonna surround him, and then one at a time only, we're gonna have a dead sprint at him, and he's gonna just dodge <laughs> us and break our wrists. It's so stupid, they never just jump him. I hate it. Well, do you think part of it is yeah. he figured out that hand thing he does when he's about to really fight with somebody where he just he puts his hand over each other and does this weird hand tries mm -hmm. to lull you to sleep move mm -hmm. that people do when they're like in comedies or on tiktok or something where people are doing a parody of a parody of somebody doing karate or kung fu but this was his move for five straight movies just yeah. just deceitfulness with his hands and people are like lulled to sleep by oh what's he doing it's a little like the crane kick, but like he took it to another level, I feel yeah, like. Yeah, it's like the crane kick meets a card trick. Like he's doing that sleight of hand, like, <laughs> you know how they do the stupid thing where like, oh, I can pull my thumb apart. Like he's doing yeah. that nonsense for, for kids and it, it people just buy it. And also like there's still videos of him in the last five years at some sort of martial arts clinics and they got guys with 12th degree black belts running at him and he just drops them left and right effortlessly. Yeah. And it's all like, is this, a, is this a work? What is going on? There, we talked about this in the last Seagal pod. There's a lot of bad stuff about him working, working rough with yeah. stuntmen and actors. A yeah. little like Bill Goldberg in, in, who in wrestling was famous yeah. for just everybody hated wrestling him. He worked way too rough. And Seagal, like multiple people were suing him at some point. Uh, there were actors that are still pissed off 25 years later. So not only could you not land a punch on him, he was actually going to punch you for real. So, <laughs> Seagal might have been a psycho. <laughs> he he might have been a sociopath. It's unclear. Uh, yeah, no, no one can land a movie punch on me, but I'm actually going to break your nose, and I'm just going to do it. They, listen, there's so many myths about Seagal and the treatment of crew and the treatment of the, the ladies, which is totally different. You know the greatest one, and I don't, I don't, did we get into this on the Hard to Kill? The Doesn't myth matter, goes, we'll do it again. All right. The myth goes that there's this veteran stunt performer, this guy who's out there doing interviews since he's talked about it. He's on Out for Justice. And Seagal's popping off during shooting, he's on set, and he's saying, any move you put me in, any choke, any submission, I can get out of. Who wants to try it? So they all want to try it. This one guy puts <laughs> him in a choke, Yeah. and the legend goes that he choked him so hard that Seagal shit his pants right there on the set and had to clear out the set. And that's the story. And he tells it to this day that that is real. And I want to believe it. It's a great story. It would be, awesome. it would be incredible if it was true. <laughs> is, is Seagal like, when he goes into these movies, like Casey Ryback, not Italian, <laughs> but behaves Italian. Right. He, all of his characters are basically the same character, but you're from Chicago. Yeah. Um, like Chicago Italian, like mm -hmm. they could, you could see him at Gino's East and they're upset that their, their pies five minutes late and they're like, Hey, what's going on here? That's kind of his thing, but I don't feel like he's Italian and I'm not sure he's from Chicago. So what, wh who influenced him? What, what's your psychological take on this? Well, 
basically, if 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 Seagal was around right now, he would just want to be Tommy DeVito. Like that's the guy he wants to be. <laughs> so he, he would wants just more of the jersey. Yeah, he'd wear the jersey. He'd do the little gesture, and then he'd break your wrist. Um, it's it's in Out for Justice. He goes all the way, and his character's name is Gino Fellino. And like then he's in Brooklyn, and that's like that's even more Italian than Tommy DeVito. So I don't even know what his inspiration is because it's not Southside Chicago, it's not Brooklyn. He's more of a California guy, but then also Bill, there's always that weird Far East influence on him. So I don't really know where he's like this sort of wannabe mutt, and I don't really know who he actually is. I wonder what state would want to claim him. I feel like Jersey would take him. Mm. Why? Why Jersey? That just feels like I don't know. Feet. Like I feel like Chicago would be maybe interested in talking yeah. about an acquisition. <laughs> maybe not now. Maybe with all not all the stuff that's happening. And what's crazy about this? We just spent ten minutes talking about Seagal, and I'm not even sure this is a Seagal movie. You're right. I actually think you could make a real case that this is a Tommy Lee Jones movie. And in fact, I'm going to make it right now. I think this is a Tommy Lee Jones movie yeah. that Seagal happens to be in. You agree or disagree? I agree, and it's an interesting thing because. The movie, Under Siege, it is all his face on the poster. It is all Seagal, there's nobody else, and yet he's out for a lot of the movie. Tommy Lee is amazing. And Bill, for me, this was really important because I'd never seen Tommy Lee Jones before this movie. I had no idea who he was. I mm. didn't see any of the projects or movies beforehand. So when I see this in the theater, I'm 13 years old, and I'm here to see Seagal crack skulls. And meanwhile, this guy who's just on so much blow and a rock star, I thought he was amazing. And he doesn't, it's not that he steals the movie, he just, he takes it from the beginning and it's never stolen back. Yeah, you can't even say it's a steal. It's an ownership thing. It's weird because there's this crazy Tommy Lee Jones run that happens right around now. And it starts with JFK at 91. It goes to Under Siege it blows up for good in The Fugitive. And then he becomes a guy you can put on a poster because in 94, he's in blow, blown away. Then he's in The Client. Then he's mm -hmm. in Natural Born Killers in The Cobb. And he just becomes Tommy Lee Jones, culminating in Batman and Forever. He plays uh, Harvey Two-Face. Mm -hmm. But when you go back to the 80s, and yeah. I was there because I'm yeah. old, I, I couldn't tell the difference between him and Scott Glenn for like 12 <laughs> years. I didn't know who was who. Like I didn't know, was Tommy Lee Jones an urban cowboy or was it Scott Glenn? When Silence of the Lambs, is that Tommy Lee Jones or Scott Glenn? I, I just didn't know. And then mm -hmm. all of a sudden he blew up as Tommy Lee Jones. But I think it was this movie that did it. Well, yeah, because, you know, we got to get into this. What's fun about, about Under Siege, it's the de facto origin story for The Fugitive. It's, it's Andrew right. Davis who gets the movie because of this. And like the that guys in this movie are so fun because there's like five people who go on to be in The Fugitive. So... Tommy Lee gets the Oscar for The Fugitive, and then the, the rest of his life, he's just set. But as a 13-year-old kid, I saw Tommy Lee Jones, and I just, I think of Tommy Lee, I was like the drummer for Motley Crue. I, like, who is this? Like, yeah. I, that's the only Tommy Lee I know who also went on to make successful movies. But uh, I loved him, and I'd never seen him before. I don't know any of that stuff with the Scott Glenn. I just didn't, it wasn't on my radar. Yeah, if you go backwards, so in 87, he's in the big town, with uh, Matt Dillon and Diane Lane, which is an important movie for the Diane Lane fans out there. And I, I count myself I as you. one of them. But then TV movie, Stranger on My Land. He's in something called Stormy Monday. He's in April Morning, another TV movie. He's in Gotham, a TV movie. He's in Lonesome Dove, a TV miniseries. Then he's in The Package, which was directed. That's a good Gene Hackman movie directed yeah. by Andrew Davis. Mm. Firebirds in 1990. So I did, that's four years of Tommy Lee Jones. Like nothing's going on. He's, so when you say like, how did he end up in this movie? He's, he's the most over, maybe other than Lithgow, the most overqualified actor we've had in one of these movies. For him, it was like a job. And, and he's like, if I kill this, maybe this will lead to other stuff. So it makes more sense when you see the context, but I don't know what took Hollywood so long to discover Tommy Lee Jones. It doesn't make a lot of sense. To me, he's just always this old guy. Like, I, I don't know, I, I can't picture 25 year old Tommy Lee Jones. He's always this cantankerous he's old like guy. He's like Gene Hackman, yeah. Yeah, or like Michael Caine or Morgan Freeman. Like, I don't know them in, in their 20s. I've, they've been the same age my entire life. But like, I knew Busey. You better believe I knew Busey. Like the Busey piece of this is big because it's a real awesome tandem of bad guys in this. Yeah, and Busey's coming off Point Break, which was a very, very, very important uh, early 90s movie. One of the first ones we did on the rewatchables, actually. Tommy Lee's off after this, because by 97, he's doing Men in Black. 
Mm-hmm. In 98, they're doing The Fugitive again as U.S. Marshals mm-hmm. with no Harrison Ford, which is a complicated movie for the Fugitive fans. I kind of like it, but I'm also like super disappointed. Where do you stand on that one? I'm, I'm just super disappointed by that movie, but I also like it. Yeah, it's disappointing. Uh, I like that Newman, the guy with the ponytail, gets killed because I don't like that character. It's also a yeah. weird Robert Downey in the middle of all his shit piece is in that movie. Yeah. And that's yeah. nuts. It's a very strange, I've only seen it one time, but it's, it's not really rewatchable. And then he just keeps going and then it culminates with No Country for Old Men, which was the best movie that he's been in. Oh yeah. Andrew Davis, uh-huh. really interesting. So he's the director of this, but um, I didn't even realize how many things that he was involved with before this. What's he got? That I really like, starting with Code of Silence in 1985, which is in the running for best Chuck Norris movie. <laughs> it's either Chuck, no- it's either that or Silent Rage, but it's a big Chicago movie. It is. It's like, it's a heart of Chicago. We're in there. We're filming everything there. And he actually pulls out a semi-decent Chuck performance, which is basically impossible because Chuck can't act. Very difficult. Then he does Above the Law. Then he does The Package, Under Siege, and then it culminates in The Fugitive. And that's, you know, the probably in the running for the best action movie of all time. Nice run for him. There's other stuff going on though, because, oh, by the way, I forgot to mention Tommy Lee plays a disillusioned former CIA operative. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's a better four words for an action movie. (laughs) Disillusioned. Great. You got me right away. Former solid CIA. Okay. Mm -hmm. Operative. Jesus. Fantastic. What are you capable of? How much information do you have? (laughs) Um, Erica Leniak is in this. Let's talk about it. This was a big, a big thing that she was in this because Playboy, she was the in the real July 1989 Playboy magazine. Yep. Playboy magazine like legitimately mattered in the 80s. I know we'll we'll try to explain that. Craig, do you want to come on for one second here? Yeah, let's do this. Sure. Yeah, we because Craig every once in a while is confused by nudity and whatever elite, from the 80s. Elite 90s. gratuitous nudity in this movie. Yeah. Playboy magazine and the SI <laughs> swimsuit issue were probably the two most important pieces of media in the 80s related to ladies. Mm-hmm. So her being a July 1989 Playboy cover person meant that somebody my age actually knew who she was from mm-hmm. the magazine. So it starts there. She had a recurring role on Charles in Charge, which mm-hmm. was a very important, terrible TV show with Scott Bayo and Willie Ames. And then she was one of the female leads in Baywatch for the first three years, mm-hmm. which became kind of, rep- would you say it replaced Playboy magazine, Kyle? Yeah, it certainly took a lot of the steam out. And when she left, then Pamela came in, then it went to the stratosphere. Um, yeah. He would watch it and he got a lot of the same experience. And, and, there's, and there's nothing like that now. There's no version of her that can be in a movie, right? There's no Playboy model that could be in a movie. No. Mm-hmm. It, it, she also was John Stamos's girlfriend in an episode of Full House. Incredible. And then she was in this. And it's an arc of like really good looking woman that's not afraid maybe to go topless yeah. and pops around for five, six years that I don't know how this happens now. I guess uh, like reality TV, maybe I don't even know. And, and she's not great in this movie, but she's also not bad. She actually no. kind of fits with Seagal quite nicely. Like they're both the same level of actor, and it actually kind of works between the two of them. Craig, first of all, how dare you? She is great in this movie. <laughs> she's not bad. I, she's not bad. Think, that's how I. I think it's a terrific performance by Erica. Uh, <laughs> she's working with Seagal, who's the most loathsome person to work with in the '90s, and actually. Kyle, she seems like she likes him by the end of the movie. I don't know. I, maybe she maybe she was hypnotized. Listen, the fact that she could be in the same room on a battleship with him and not be vomiting, it makes her Meryl Streep, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. I, it, it's, it's a tough hang. But I think, Craig, like what you represent. So last time we did one of these, we did uh, Toy Soldiers. And yeah. I remember Craig was really confused why the bunch of guys is sitting around together listening to phone sex. He was like, what the hell? You guys watch porn together? And Bill and I were trying to explain to you, Craig, it was just different. It was different. So why I bring this up is the topless scene in this movie, it's like five seconds long. It's 1992. I almost had it for which age the best slash worst because it made me nostalgic. Those scenes were so important to someone who was a 13-year-old kid who had no internet, no phone, no Playboys like he had his hands on, and no, no porn. You would rewind it 50 times and then you would pause the VHS tape just to look at it. 
And it was yeah. like, it was so critical to us as teenagers to survive with that stuff. Yeah, it was like discovering like gold on the bottom of a river or something. Like, oh my God. Like yes. even in college, same thing. Like this was, she's in this. It's like, ah, oh, I wonder who knows. And then when she hops out of the birthday cake, which is, it is a what's age the worst, but also a what's age the best because yes. of that era of using using a scene like that as kind of a weapon. And it went away. And then Halle Berry tried to bring it back with Swordfish yep. and it, it just... Didn't really lie. I think the internet's just ruined it, Craig. You make a great point. I, I'm honestly nostalgic for that time. It's too easy now. I can't imagine what it's going to be like 40 years from now. Like, am I going to be telling my grandkids about the, the the old days of nudity? Like, I don't even know what my grandkids are going to be watching. Uh, well, but. she peaked with this movie, and then she was in, uh, she was Ellie Mae Clampett in the Beverly yeah. Hillbillies. How long was and, she in that uh, cake? Long time. Well, <laughs> we, 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 it's coming up. It's coming Ready up to later. Go. We have right, I'll, I'll, I'll get out of here. Um, <laughs> the film was based on an original spec script by J.F. Lawton called Dreadnought. Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's one of the worst titles ever, which sold for a million dollars and then mm -hmm. became a, a thing shopped around. And, if, you know, I'm sure when you have a script like Dreadnought, which is Die Hard on a Ship, um, you you go to the usual suspects, right? Can we get Stallone? Come on, let's do it. Can we yeah. get Arnold? Is Bruce 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 isn't gonna want to do this? Right. Van Damme, maybe no, he's he's out. Um it, should we try Seagal? Sure. Oh, Seagal's interested. Got a meeting with him. Had the meeting go. <laughs> ah, it went kind of terrible. Like Seagal's a dick, but it seems like he wants to do it. Well, we have another and then all of a sudden they're making Dreadnought and they changed the name and we're off. This movie got two Oscar nominations for sound. I, I thought it was for Erica Leniak, no? It, it, was, it was just for sound. <laughs> this movie had a $35 million budget and made $156.6 million. Jesus. I can't believe it only cost 35 to make that movie. Now it would be a $180 million movie. It's nuts. Yeah, you would think like with the explosions they had, that was like 20 million right there. Yeah. This movie at the time was the most successful film that had not been screened for critics prior to release, which is usually a horrible sign. Terrible. Yeah. yeah. I wonder why. Like they had great performances. They, they It's a cool looking movie that the critics would have liked it. So we yeah, have no Ebert review of this or no? Oh, we sure do. <laughs> I, I wonder if maybe people were getting a little bored of the Die Hard on a blank at this point. And we've taught, I don't even need to go over the Die Hard on a right. blank because we've we've hit it so many times. But this is the height of it. And they're just like, what about a boat? Mm -hmm. What are, you know, and they're just trying, what about a mountain? And they're just trying to do all of it. But I, I, I actually do think this is probably the best scenario of a Die Hard on a blank other than Die Hard. I think it's a good take. And I would echo it and say, I think this is the closest representation of Die Hard that all of the ones that did it. And I'll quickly, I'll tell you why. The boat is kind of like a skyscraper. It's set up the same way. It's like a skyscraper in the sea. You yeah. have this like brilliant actor as the villain. You got his blonde haired heavy as the second who has personal beef with the yeah. hero. There's a girl who gets involved towards the end. And it just kind of feels the most like Die Hard in a sense. I think they do a good job. Yeah, I agree with you. Ebert. Let's go. Three stars. Come on. Hell he yes. Said, he said, the formula is obvious. Die Hard goes to see. I walked into the screening in a cynical frame of mind, but then a funny thing happened. The movie started working for me. Rush. Rush. <laughs> and then uh, there's, a, there's a Cisco and Ebert review where they give it two enthusiastic thumbs up. And Cisco says, Cisco, who's, let, let's be honest, was kind of a dick to the action sure. genre over the years. He said, it's one of the best times you're going to have at a movie this year, Under Siege. And it became a huge success and was the peak of Seagal. Most rewatchable scene. Um, I'm in for any moment where Seagal, like we discussed earlier, is moving through the ship with all of these people who are hanging on his every word, even mm -hmm. though he's not that interesting. <laughs> Just really makes me laugh. But the redheaded guy comes in and he does the, I guess that means it won't get to see you go through puberty. Yep. People are dying like he's doing Eddie Murphy and Delirious, like that level of comedy. Um, he makes fun of the guy at one point. He does the Southern accent. Yeah, hey, I don't know what that and then is. Then he keeps it going for some reason. Then Busey comes in and does the, this smells like a lard omelet, spits in his bouillabaisse, and Seagal punches Busey. 
he punches two other guys and he goes, okay, all right, okay, all right, okay, all right. It's just, everything's great. It's just a great start. I don't know what he's doing. Seagal's trying this Cajun deal where he talks like he's from New Orleans and then the menu you revealed is a lot of Cajun inspired food and mm. boule bays. Like, what? They're coming from Hawaii. They're, they're not even close to Louisiana. It doesn't make sense, but it does set the scene. And I like when he punches Busey. It, the whole thing works. Every time Busey's on screen, I can't take my eyes off. Yeah, it's it's weird. I don't, I mean, Busey's obviously nuts because because yeah. he was becoming a Howard Stern guest within probably eight years of this. Sure. But he really did have a nice run as the crazy guy. And then Dennis Hopper, I felt like in Speed, was a little on Busey's corner mm -hmm. with that character. That felt like a Busey part where they were like, ah, we can't get Busey again. He's been in too many of these. We'll get Dennis Hopper and tell him to do Busey. It it does it, it takes my breath away when he hawks that loogie in that pot. Like that is such a ruthless thing to do to anyone who cooks or anyone who appreciates yeah. food. It's a perfect villain move. Yeah. Disgusting. Next one, the big shootout, where we have Tommy Lee with a leather jacket, mm -hmm. bandana and sunglasses. We Busey and drag for reasons that remain unclear. I, I don't know if you want to do this now or later, but I Go still ahead. don't know with, with the whole plan why Busey had to be in drag, what the point of that was. Like this guy's one of the most high, he's one of the highest ranking officers in the ship. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, a whole hierarchy and a respect thing. And I, I just don't know what the point of that was. It's bizarre. It's very bizarre. And they're just trying to make him seem crazy and fun. But also like back then, it was, people thought it was funny, I guess, for men to dress in drag. Like, it was yeah. a classic SNL mechanism for a long time. Like, even totally. You can see Derek Jeter hosted SNL, and they're like, dress him up like a woman. It's funny. It's it's idiotic. And watching the movie back now, it's very strange. Because if you haven't seen it in a while and you're listening, you forgot that Busey comes out dressed like a woman with boobs and all that stuff. Like, it's very strange. For five minutes, he wears it. Probably could have done without that. I'm I think the, the weirdest strange. part is that a couple people in the movie, the, some of the other characters in the ship were like kind of into him. <laughs> <laughs> well, they've been at sea for a long time, I yes. guess. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say it was weird in 1992. It was. It, it was like, what are they doing? Why? Because you do it if he's like the comic relief sidekick guy, but yeah. they're also trying to present him as an authority figure. And that was the part I didn't get. Like you would have thought he would have asked some lowly private to do it. Also, here's anyway. an idea. You, you paid money for a stripper who's in the other room. Like, why don't you bring her in? Like, what, what is yeah. she doing at this point? Why is he dressing up? It doesn't make yeah. sense. Eric is right there. Um, yeah. The only thing I can think is they they it's like kind of a red herring because then it gets to Tommy Lee asking who's the highest, highest ranking, ranking officer in yeah. the room followed by the shot to the head and then just people start dying left and right and we're off so uh it's a good scene not as good as the scene when Seagal escapes finally he's trapped in the he's trapped in the locker for a while Jack Torrance the shining style finally yeah. gets out um couple things I love here I love when our action hero has to hide in the ceiling and then lowers himself down. But I don't think it's ever not worked for me. I also yeah. think it's kind of, I mean, you're a guy who's, you know, you're in pretty good shape. You live to, love to you, live. Bill. That's not an easy one to lower yourself down. Very right? difficult. Yeah, very difficult. It, it always works. It always looks cinematic. It always, and then it puts you at the perfect height to kick someone in the face who's standing. Yeah. It even works in Jurassic Park when those kids are running from the raptors and they go up in there. It always works. It should be in every movie. The Firm has probably my favorite version of it. Oh, yeah. he's, he's sweating on the on Wolfer Brimley and then finally jumps down and hits him. I'm not positive that Seagal that lowers himself down. I don't know either. It's like 50% chance it's a stuntman. Yeah. I don't know if he had the uh, upper body to pull it off. Um, also, great knife to the neck. Seagal has some good kills in here. Like he has some later on in the movie, he has like the prison, the quick three stabbers that they'll have in prison movies. We're like, oh, Seagal knows some things. Um, never gets punched, just decisive never. wins all the way around. We're up. The next one's very short for rewatchable, but it fucking kills me. I mailed it to you. Um, when he goes in, he sees the captain, the guy who's been protecting him. Seagal's on the ship. Basically, we find out later the reasons, but this captain's been protecting him. So he sees the captain. He decides to put the white jacket over him to cover the captain's dead yeah. body because Gary Busey's killed him. And then he's like, what if I take like four more, five, four or five more seconds here 
and I'll have a moment as an actor. Just keep rolling, guys. And he does. It's there's, really great. There's supposed to be this real feeling there. And you can tell the director worked hard with Steve there. Like, you know, Steve, this guy meant a lot to you. He brought you on as a personal cook. And like, this is a sense of loss. And just really let the audience feel it. And he just sits there and puts the blanket over him. You don't feel really much of anything. But he's trying to act really hard then. It's, it's definitely not the first take either. <laughs> <laughs> Might have been take four. Steve, that was great. That was great. Let's just do one more for safety. Let's go again. Yeah, yes. let's just go one more and maybe stare off in the distance for one more second. Bill, remember when we did Hard to Kill and there's the moment where he's having that, he's thinking about like, Senator Trent said a blood bank and he, uh, I, I'm going to solve the puzzle. He's acting his ass off there. You yeah. always get one moment for Steve where like, sorry, dude, there's no one to punch and no woman to ogle. You just have right. to be an actor for two seconds. Can you please? Just look intense. Can yeah. you do it? Can you pull it off? <laughs> Next one, uh, I just wrote down Tommy Lee is cooking. This is when he's explaining his motives yeah. to the uh, the people in the war room. He does the welcome to the revolution, cut to the obligatory, one of the people in the war room going, he's flipped. Yeah. He's completely flipped, which yeah. you need. You need somebody to flip and then you need somebody to recognize the flipping. Um, so basically what's happening here for people uh, who didn't really understand the plot, Tommy Lee plays Stranix. I don't, weird name, by the way, Stranix. Yeah, I don't get it. It's, it, it makes me also think maybe Schwarzenegger, they're trying to lure him in and be like, so you get to say his <laughs> Um But they, they're they trying to seize control of the ship and the weapons on it. And what they want to do is obliterate all the tracking systems in Pearl Harbor because it's the 50th anniversary of Pearl Harbor. Yeah. So it's some sort of weird Pearl Harbor and then they're going to sell some tomahawks to North Korea. But basically they're on the ship, they're going to get all this stuff, they're going to blow up. Pearl Harbor. That's mm -hmm. that's what's trying to happen here. But I, I, how many times did you have to watch this movie to fully understand it? Like 14, 12? It's a lot. Eight? Yeah, it's a lot. And then his speech is so unintelligible to the people. And he does the, the topsoil and the UV rays and something about venereal diseases. But I will say, like, this is why you hire Tommy Lee. The writing yeah. is so bad and so weird, but he just does it like, fuck it, I'm a rock star and I'm crazy. Yeah. And you buy it. And his acting really saves that scene. Did we have him when we did the uh the scale where Alan Rickman was a 10? Did we should we have had Tommy Lee as like a nine and a half in this movie? Or I think we forgot not, him. Or, I think we forgot him, right? Yeah. I ha I had um I, I had the guy from uh it's Gary Oldman in Air Force One as the nine. Tommy Lee is way up there. And we had we had Toy Soldiers as the one. I think you yeah. had Passenger 57 as the one, which you might have been right about that one. But Tommy Lee is up there. I, he might be the nine with Gary Oldman right there, the nine five. Would you would you sneak him to a nine nine point five or no? He's just so funny and he's charismatic. Yeah. And I have Gary Oldman at the nine, and he's nothing funny whatsoever. So maybe I would. He he carries the movie. Gary Oldman does not carry Air Force One. Tommy Lee carries under siege. He's the nine five. We will do Air Force One in twenty twenty four because right. I watched it when I had COVID and. Um, it's just let's say I had some nitpicks. <laughs> really? <laughs> There's some nits in that movie, but I loved it. I had a great time. You know when you uh, do it next year, November, election year, 2024, President James true. Marshall kicking ass on Air Force <laughs> One. That's when you do it. Next one, just a quickie, the microwave blowing up. I love that. So the microwave's going off for like an hour and a half, yeah, but it on. only needed, we needed the five second beep, beep, beep countdown before it blew up. Like, wouldn't it have blown up? What was he microwaving? And wouldn't it have blown up way sooner? How did he time it so perfectly? This is why the picking nits section exists. I think you and I both have a lot of questions about the microwave. I will just say this. This made such an impression on me at the time, at 13, that you can make a bomb out of a microwave. A yeah. lot of us fantasize when the microwave is ticking down that it's going to be a bomb. I use the microwave in my house like three times a day. I got little kids. I always think of this scene from Under Siege mm. every time I use a microwave. And no microwave in history has ever been made to have an audible tick for the last five seconds. It doesn't make sense. It's great. I wish you could buy it. I wish we could get it at Target. The big reveal that Ryback is actually a real guy. Yeah. Which we wait. We're, we're past the hour mark at this point, And we find out that he had an extremely distinguished career until Panama. When most of his SEAL team was killed due, due to poor intelligence at the airport. Yep. And then we have that guy who's like, every time there's always 
somebody in another, we talked about this in Toll Soldiers. There's somebody in another location yep. who's just like, no, no, we're fine. We got Ryback or we got, we got Sean Astin. And this guy, the, the older guy says, but by the way, he could have offered this information a lot sooner. He says, Ryback's a warrior. He's the best there is. Oh yeah. When he got back from Panama, he punched out the officer in charge. <laughs> Captain Adams took him aboard as his personal cook so he could finish out his 20. <laughs> Just, wait, could, could you have told us that five hours ago? Would have helped. And I like that when he says, punched out his officer in charge, a whole room of military people are like, oh, fuck yeah. Yeah, that's <laughs> awesome. Like they, they actually liked it. None of them shake their heads. And it's that silver fox who's saying it. Who's in like yeah. every military movie and he has yeah. a real military background. Like he just delivers it perfectly. But there is always one guy who says, now, hold on. There's a secret file. This guy can kick some ass. Like even in Air Force One, when the president's up there, there's one guy who's like, remember, our president was fought and did such and such tours of duty and he can fight. There was some, yeah. somebody who sticks up for him and says, I think we're in good hands with this guy. Also, Panama is a, is a great location to just throw around in movies like this because great it call. sounds like, oh, he, he had some, I didn't realize he had something in Panama. Cuba's another one. Oh, he, yeah, there's was this hot. thing in Cuba that happened and you don't even really need to elaborate. It's just, oh, it's Panama. It must've been, must've been a, a big thing. Um, next I have written down for rewatchable scenes, Seagal plans an attack and does it with a makeshift crew in three seconds. Come on. Mm -hmm. It starts with him trying to get the guy from blood in and blood out, whatever that guy's name is. I don't know. He's like, "Hey, get it!" And he's like, "I ain't do it. I do laundry." <laughs> and he's just like, he's, just, he's like, "Hey, you don't want to save the, the Navy. boat." <laughs> uh, and then the commander says, "Well, if I can't control you, I might as well support you." The guy oh, in yeah. the war room, and yeah. Seagal just goes for it, and they things blow up. He wipes out four guys with a knife. There's a dangling over the boat moment for really no reason nope. i don't even know what it accomplished he dangles over the boat then just comes back everyone still knows he's on the boat a little bit later this is another rewatchable scene he makes a bomb using a grenade a condom mm -hmm. a wire oil a recorder and a knapsack as the playmate of uh july 89 just stares lovingly at him Ugh. i look at that scene bill and i'm just like you got Seagal on set with a playmate and there's a condom involved. I don't even, I, it's disgusting. I can already feel the tension and the jokes that he was making. I just want that scene to end. <laughs> <laughs> that should have been a magnum, honey. Like, ugh. I don't, I don't want his well, condom anywhere near Seagal. It is pretty, he, they make a point of him tearing it and opening it. And then she kind of wow. looks at him like, and he makes it going longer on? and longer. Yeah. And you're like, she's like, get me the hell out of here. I'm going to jump overboard. Well, it gets worse because then he climbs into a scuba suit. We get to see Seagal in a scuba <laughs> suit. We get to see him swimming to a different sub. He gets hurt. Then he's fine. Mm -hmm. She has to like help him walk, but that, then he's okay. And then later on, uh, the same crew, they just kill everybody with a bunch of missiles. Yeah. And we get to see him say stuff like, all right, close the breach. Fire in the hole. Direct hit. And then I mailed you this clip. It's one of the funniest clips of any Seagal movie. Yeah. He high fives somebody and then she comes in for like mm -hmm. a hug mm -hmm. and he doesn't really hug her, but it's a no. full body hug and he just kind of stares past her. And it's the weirdest 10 minutes of this movie other than the ending. It's, it's, it's a terrible, terrible hug. It's like a grandmother hug and she doesn't want to do it. And just take our word for it. If you're listening I'm gonna put, right I'll now, put it on my Instagram. Up. Yeah. I'll put it on my Instagram after we post the movie. Yeah, it's, there, it's there's that, a tandem that clip bad. to that bill that we're going to get to that happens at the end of the movie. That is it's there's, there's two that go together. Fire in the hole. These guys were like doing laundry and they're <laughs> putting <laughs> torpedoes together. It's amazing. Um, so then we have the fight scene with Tommy Lee. Yeah. One of my favorite action movie things is when the good guy and the bad guy right before the fight recognize each other from the sure. past. I like that moment. It's like, oh, it's good to see you again. Yeah. Um, and then we get the, you are good. You're really good. It's going to be a shame to kill you. Mm -hmm. I feel like we've had that in nine different movies, variation yeah. of that. Um, but then we get the, these guys are more alike than you think part. Mm -hmm. You and I are puppets in the same play. He's trying to, they're trying to forge some sort of, sure. I don't know why he just didn't shoot him in the first second. Never. It's a hole. Mm -hmm. But uh, I don't know if we're buying that, that these guys are more alike than maybe Seagal wanted to admit. Yeah, I mean, maybe. They, the moment where they recognize each other, 
it's pretty cool moment. And Seagal holds his own. It's good acting by both of them. Yeah. And, but Tommy Lee makes that mistake. They all do. They all say, first, you're going to watch the end of the world, like witness what I do. And then they always come back and then they have the knife fight. And we got to get into that, too, because the men- you mentioned that. So you mentioned that it's how Seagal, even in the fight with Tommy Lee, doesn't get hurt. and He never gets hurt with anybody. If you watch this fight really closely, this is crazy. He does get a slight cut. Seagal does. Right. His cheek. And then when you go back, the cut is gone. So, like, it's almost like Seagal's <laughs> like, right. no, that shit's in my contract. Take that out. You're like, Steve, it doesn't tra- it doesn't track. I don't care. Take it out. He still can't be injured. It's maddening. That's such a good I don't know how I didn't have that in picking nits. Yeah, it's in his contract. Can't he wouldn't hurt. even put like the fake scratch o- nope. over his eye. It's terrible. Uh really bad end of the fight when he kills him put he puts his finger through the guy's eye yeah then we get the knife but it's the obvious that's not tommy lee jones anymore it's mm-hmm. some body double because they don't realize that we're gonna have hd tvs and pause buttons <laughs> then he puts him to the microwave there should have been an awesome joke here and he just says keep the faith stranix oh, and he right. walks away it's like you could really he, he, writers on the set nobody could have topped that I had the exact same thing written down, keep the faith, Stratix, which is a terrible line. Also, at that exact time in, in history, Bon Jovi had an album out called Keep the Faith. It's distracting, it's stupid. You got a Good million point. nautical references. You could have said, look, you're dead in the water, Stratix, anything at all, or just go with the one he says in Hard to Kill, which is, that's for my wife, fuck you and die. He doesn't even have a wife. It would work better <laughs> than Keep the Faith. <laughs> It would have been funny if he just said that again. That's his, I'll be back. That's for my wife. Fuck you and die. It's an awesome line. Should have said just, that. How about this? He could have just said, I'm going to defrost you for a few minutes, Stranix. Like it's something tied to the microwave. <laughs> to the culinary thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. I don't know. Oh, that's uh, good. Order up, the en- Stranix. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the ending is unbelievable. Let's go. Comes on the boat. They basically rip off the end of Top Gun. Everybody's on the deck cheering. Right. I'm just going to read you the actual dialogue. This is what's on the page. Okay. Hey, what did I miss, Chief? That's the Seagal. Everyone laughs. And then he says, somebody says to him, you still got a date? And Seagal responds, that's right. Everybody breaks up laughing again. (laughs) Somebody says, it looks like you're going to need three or four stitches, so I want to see you down in the infirmary. And Seagal goes... Yeah, I'm afraid of needles. Everyone, oh! uproarious laughter at that one. Yeah, I'm afraid of needles. Hilarious. You did it again, Seagal. They're all laughing like, like Jason Garrett laughing at everything Tariko says. <laughs> Just dying. <laughs> and then somebody says, hey, Case, what's for breakfast? And he goes, subs, Tackman, subs. Yeah. Uproarious laughter again. He's He's at this point, he's just hit the zone. And then uh, the last person says, hey, Case, show me a move. And what happens next? Here's one move, and his move is grabbing the woman by the back of the head and going in for this Jabba the Hutt to Princess Leia terrifying kiss. I watch that, movie, and I feel like that's the only time I'm watching a movie and I'm seeing a crime occur on camera. (laughs) Not a fictional one, a real one. It has all the vibes of that was some sort of Seagal ad lib. Like they're just sitting around and Seagal's like, hey, give me one more take. I'm going to try something. And he just plants one on her. She looks terrified. It makes me so uncomfortable, man. It's his one move. That's not a move, Steve. That's assault. You can't, that's not a move. What are you doing? Well, here's the thing. I, st- I, I watched it a few times because I knew gross. we'd have to break this down. She seems weirdly happy about it and i don't know if she's happy because thank god it's over or if she's happy about it because she's thinking thank god it's over Uh or she's thinking thanks god it's over but there's it's like relief caused with um i knew that i've been dreading this for three days and now Uh it happened there's like a 10 percent chance she it was an ad lib and she just thought it was funny she doesn't seem horrified by it though Either her acting is really good and she Oh, that's sells a good it. point. I like your theory that, all right, so it's, you know, day 105 and on the shot chart, we got the Ryback and Jordan kiss. And she's like, God damn it. I have to do this all day. And so she, when she was done, 
She's like, oh, thank God. The rest of it I can do. I just had to kiss Jabba the Hutt and he'd slip the tongue, which you don't even see, by the way, because you don't see their mouths. It's just that I, I, I really remember being as a kid being like, wow, was he supposed to do that? Because don't you feel like it has that air of they're just sitting around like being loose. It's not something that's scripted. And like maybe the actors are ad-libbing a little bit and that was his ad-lib. Well, there's a couple of uncomfortable moments of where she's just the only woman in the boat, right? Yeah. So you have, you have that piece too. And, yeah. Um, so you, you got that there, but maybe the reaction is you're, you're at a long dinner table and somebody hates oysters and you're like, I bet you won't shoot that giant oyster. And someone's like, all right, how much? 20 bucks. I'll do it. And they throw it down and then they're kind of happy after that's, yeah. that's the vibe she has. Like she just threw down a gross oyster and she's done and the work is over and you have to pay me. I just, he is one move. I, I, <laughs> Think of like, let's start to think like the great pisses in film history. If it was like a- That's, it's you know, last. <laughs> like gone with the wind. If they right. were like, hey, Rhett, show us a move. And he dips Scarlet hair. He's like, here's one move. And he just plants it on her. Or Jack and Rose. Hey, Jack, yeah. show us a move. Here's one move, guys. It's so bad. And it makes me uncomfortable. But I think you might've been onto something. It's like she finished the one ship challenge. And now she's happy and relieved. So God bless her. I'm interested to look forward to the Andean Red Zay Watanabe Award about what Jordan and Casey are doing next. I'm sure we'll get to. Also, no hint at all, really, of sexual tension with them until he's in the scuba suit. Maybe she has a thing for scuba suit guys. I don't know. Bill, do you have the ages in front of you? I, I, I'm talking about those two actors. I don't mm. know. I'm going to just guess. I'm going to say 23 and 42 for Erica Laniac and Steven Seagal, which I don't love. Uh, let's see. All right, Seagal you, it's, it's was... It's 40 and 23, so you're pretty close. Yeah. Craig, you'd never seen this movie, which we're going to talk about later, but uh, when Seagal plants one on her at the end, what was your reaction? Uh, I had the exact same thought as Kyle, and I was like, this is 100% improvised. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's either that, Bill, or the, someone from on high says... Listen, we got to have a kiss. I know you guys didn't get one, but it's our male lead and it's this, this woman we hired. We got to have a kiss. So they just threw it together last second. And they're like, Steve, just ad lib something. It, it's clearly not a scripted thing. It's what makes it uncomfortable. You feel like you're witnessing something real. <laughs> With that bro. said, she does, like, I don't know, maybe she's a better actress than I'm giving her credit for because she does kind of seem into him in this movie, which is what her role calls for. So, hmm. well, he Good is. For her. He is a Chicago, New Orleans, maybe Italian, maybe not <laughs> chef who, who from used Jersey. To be a Navy How Seal. big is he? Know. Is he like 6'4? I don't know. I think he, I say six two. Okay, he seems giant. Yeah. Mm. Or had they just put shorter actors around he him? He is All six right, four. I just googled it. Six four. Seagal. All right. Big guy. All right. So what'd you have, Kyle? What was your most rewatchable scene? Listen, I'm supposed to say it's Tommy Lee fighting Ryback at the end, but it's the last five seconds. It's here's one move. It's, I can't <laughs> stop watching it, Bill. It's like the it's like the, it's like an eight millimeter. Like the film is real. Like, it's, I feel like a Machine gave that clip from the dailies. That's I can't stop watching it. I love that scene just because it's so bizarre. My uh, most rewatchable is when they're launching the missiles and <laughs> she goes good. in for the hug. It fucking the hug kills me every time. What stage the best? Really good entrances in this movie. I think. We've discussed in past action movies we've done, the entrances are crucial. The first time we see Seagal and it becomes established that he's probably the funniest person in the early 90s. Um, and they're like, right back, where's your rights? I got the dress, I forgot the pumps. Um, Tommy Lee and Erica Oleniak's entrance, awesome. both of them have really good ones. Um, just It just feels like when people show up, they show up. Busey, he shows up. It's an arrival. The first time you see Tommy Lee, he's on the helicopter with his head on Alineak's shoulder looking down her chest. And it's like, okay, this guy's not messing around. <laughs> right. Then he does that thing where he goes, <laughs> he just makes this sound effect like he's a train walking onto the boat. It's just, he, he goes for it the whole time. We mentioned already Seagal's non-funny jokes as age the best, as, as whenever this is on, it fucking no. kills me. As does the wavy hands fight technique. I love when she... I actually think the Erica Liniac character is really good in this movie. Like how they set her up where she's this fledgling actress, but mm -hmm. it's clearly not going well. Cause she says at one point, I did a Hunter episode in a wet and wild video, which is like fucking perfect. Like a Hunter awesome. episode. Hunter was this show. Love it. Fred Dreyer crime show. There was always a prostitute it, mm -hmm. it, and it just made sense. It was perfect. Another what's age the best. 
the cheering war room of military people after we've completed whatever, it just gets me every time. What's your favorite cheering war room of all time? I'm going to go war games for me. Um, I'm going to say it, it, probably uh, Armageddon when they finally oh, that's blow up one. the thing. And, there's, and, and you got the uh, Billy Bob. I, I love it. But there's so many. So many. Always works. I like, for what's age the best, actually mean villains. Mm. Like these people are like, let's just drown everyone at the bottom of the ship. Maybe that will get their attention. And then they start drowning everyone at the bottom of the ship. It's like, there's no worse way to die than just to drown in the bottom of a ship. They're like, hey, maybe that'll, maybe that'll work. These guys are awful people. There's some good history lesson stuff in here. You get to yep. know a little more about the USS Missouri, Pearl sure. Harbor. Desert Storm too. This is right after Desert Storm. And they talk about that in Iraq and all that's a big deal. The bushes are here. Sure. Uh, no Seagal ponytail is, I think this is the only movie where he doesn't have it. It's his trademark. <laughs> Any movie where someone says grimly, wake up the president. Oh, that's a great line. That's just so kidding. good. Like when AI is writing all of these action movies and just recreating early 90s action movies, wake it's up the so president will be in there. I like when Busey's still in drag and he goes, do I look like I need a psychological evaluation? That's a funny time joke. And he goes, not at all. I actually have two rules. One, I don't date musicians. And two, I don't, I don't kill like people. It's great. Bernie Casey's in this for What's Age the Best. He's sure. the guy. He was the uh, Lambda, Lambda, Lambda. UN Jefferson. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Always good to see him. Love Legendary him. 70s uh, black exploitation actor. You're a maniac drowning your own crew. They never liked me anyway. Just a good back and forth. I bet they love you now, eh? And they all just <laughs> laugh. <laughs> Seagal got interviewed as this movie was blowing up in 1992 in the LA Times. So the movie's a hit. They interview mm -hmm. him. What's he got? I'll read it in the Seagal voice. A couple okay, of quotes. Go ahead. I take the Zen philosophy about the success of the movie. I'm mm -hmm. very grateful. I don't wallow in joy. That's one. Sounds like a lot of fun at parties. He said his resistance to do the film initially because he turned it down yeah. um, had to do with the role of a character, quote, who is at first a bimbo jumping out of a cake and gets paired up with me. But then they did some revisions to the script. And he said the character, quote, gradually reveals her intelligence. Thanks, Stephen. <laughs> And then it says later, he said, human-oriented scripts are the direction he wants to take his career with films that will not be regarded as slock action. Big mistake. Mm -hmm. His next film, quote, A Man of Honor, is a more serious drama about the mafia, which he wrote, will star in, and will direct for 20th Century Fox. Mm. Never saw A Man of Honor. I, don't, I don't, know it. don't think it got to the uh, starting line. But this goes to the how he wanted to be Italian, Steven Seagal. I'm going to yeah. make a mafia movie. You're not Italian, Steven Seagal. <laughs> um, where do you stand for what stage the best on Seagal putting the blowtorch outfit on and blowtorching through a door? I stand, I stand well. I like anytime these guys DIY. They do, he does a lot of that in this. I think it goes well. I like that part. I like his blowtorch effort. What else do you have for what's age the best? I like that this crew of terrorists decides, like, if we're going to hijack this nuclear battleship, like, we're going to have some fucking fun doing it. They got food. Yeah. They got booze. They're playing rock and roll. I, I've never seen terrorists having more fun. They, they're they cracking champagne and throwing around, like, some sort of ham or beef and playing rock and roll music. It looks like they're genuinely having a good time. And I feel like if you're going to do it, <laughs> at least enjoy doing it. They're not all super serious, like the diehard terrorists. It's fun to watch. Um, yeah, I also wait, hold have, on on that point. There's, yeah. There is a lot of laughs. Like there's one part when they they call the war room and then they hang up and they're all just like, <laughs> it seemed like if you're going to join an action movie terrorist group, I think I would pick these guys probably. They party. I, I think to your point, when Tommy Lee's talking to the war room, the other guys are next to him, like Beavis and Butthead. I feel like I'm watching like a, a Jerky Boys sketch or something <laughs> like that, or, or like Crank Yankers. Like, it's like, yeah, I'm looking for a Mr. Oliver clothes off. Like it, it's, they're, they're so like, I think they're on a lot of cocaine, the, the characters, it seems yeah. that way. And it feels that way through the screen. I think they, they party. They party hard, even all down to the end. I also have, um, 
The Navy whites. <laughs> do men ever look more handsome than in the Navy whites? Yeah. Like, Harry Busey looks like Richard Gere in that shit. And I, I think it's interesting because think about this, Bill. Three months later, you get a few good men, which the Navy Wits are disparaged in both by Cruz and Nicholson. And I right. feel like those lines kind of stick to the Navy Whites, like like Giamatti talking about Merlot and Sideways. Like, that's what you always think of. But they just pop in this movie. Even Seagal at the end looks great. Costner, No Way Out's another one. Oh, yeah. Pops on the Navy Whites looking great. Maybe you should just wear Navy Whites on Good Morning Football. <laughs> Just say oh, like for a big play, big Friday before a playoff game, just come in with the Navy whites, just start saluting people. Nobody will know what's going on. Um, I have this last one for you. This is just from Wikipedia. It's about uh, Under Siege, how successful it was. And they write, it is often considered Steven Seagal's best film to date. It was followed in 1995 by a sequel, Under Siege 2, Dark Territory, which was not as well received. <laughs> <laughs> Wikipedia just cuts to the heart. That's on the wiki. Yeah. The editorial. Interesting. Yeah. Not as well you, received. Bill, I have my hand understatement. I, I, I have never seen the sequel. I never will. I've never watched it. I, when I was working for Jimmy's show, the, the whatever, 18, 20 months, I was hanging out yeah. with Corolla a lot. We both loved Under Siege, but only Under Siege 2 was ever on cable. Mm. And it was the number one thing that drove Corolla crazy other than that the goalposts weren't high enough. Anytime somebody would bring up Under Siege, it's like, Under Siege 2 is on all the time. Where's <laughs> Under Siege 1? <laughs> Under Siege 2 isn't terrible, I will say. It's not, it's 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 functional. It's on a train and Katherine Heigl's in it and that's all I know. Is there anybody else famous? No, I, it's I, functional. I, I, you, might, right. you might want to give it a whirl at some point. It's not all bad. Right. The, uh, the Kid Cuddy Pursuit of Happiness Award for Best Needle Drop. Might have to change the name to uh, Jimi Hendrix Voodoo Child. I mean, yeah. it's fucking unbelievable That's how awesome. it gets broken in. Craig, should we change the name of the award? Is it time? We certainly could. It's a real banger. It's so good. I, I And it's unexpected. It's not the yeah. the song you would have expected. I also, it was I'm pretty impressed early. I'm they paid the for it. You know, like that was what shocked me the most is that they actually were like, we're going to spend money and, and license this song. But this was pre WCW mm -hmm. that like Hulk Hogan and the NWO. That's not until like '96. So there was still some, some whoa, Jimmy, Jesus, yeah. we're going. And the for context it. is cool. So the, it's the first time the ship is coming, a plane, a jet is coming close to, to to the battleship, and they target it and lock in it, and they blow it up, and then it's like, and they pop shell of champagne, and Tom Lee's like, "Let's start the revolution." You're like, "Shit, this movie's good. It's yeah. really good." Big Kahuna Burger Award, best yeah. use of food and drink. Does uh, just a just a clarification question? Does the birthday fake birthday cake count as food and drink here? Or it does no? not. That I don't believe okay. that is made. Of, it is not cake, as the show would say. No. All right. So then we're gonna go with uh, Booyah Base and the and the Busey Loogie or the menu, the Easter egg menu of all the Ryback, Rybe the pasta Rybeckio and all that stuff. I would go with well, that unless, unless I don't, I don't know if cocaine counts as food, but I, I would go with the Ryback menu. Whatever's on that is good. Den of Thieves Benny Han Award for scene stealing location, the ocean. Yeah. Um, my, 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 my beef with the ocean in this movie, you mentioned the Seagal gets in the water. I wish we could see him freely swim in the ocean because I wonder if he swims like he runs. I would like to see that. What if uh, he swims ridiculously? So there's one part when he, Right after he's swinging from the rope and he climbs mm -hmm. back on the boat, but they get Erica Aliniak, and then he's got to basically kill three guys at once, mm -hmm. which and another two. He kills five people in a second, right. and then he runs toward Erica Aliniak, but they cut away. But for a split second, you could see him running. I'm like, ah, oh, where's so the good. master cut? Can we have a wide shot of that? I know uh, him swimming. I think would have been equally delightful. Fantastic. Oh, I'm almost. Positive he doesn't know how to swim would be my guess. <laughs> you think maybe he has no idea? <laughs> maybe not. I, I, I would I would not surprise me. You see, you know that the NFL always does these like next gen stats and they'll say that DK Metcalf ran like 22 miles per hour. <laughs> They should go back and watch Mark for Death and Hard to Kill and put next gen stats on Seagal. It'd be so big. I got a 2.7 miles an hour. Yeah, right. <laughs> It's just weird because his arms are going down and his shoulders come in and he just kind of looks like a fish on a fish hook. 
I know. Just kind of flailing. Yeah. Uh, great shot, Gordo Award. Most cinematic shot. An emotional ending. Salute us, Steven. Oh, come on. Give now. us one. Give us one for America. And then it cuts to Erica Liniak. And she's upset. And you don't know if she's upset because it's a funeral for somebody, by the way, that she's never met. Or the trauma of the kiss on the boat is just starting to, to, to come in. I shouldn't have done that. He's so gross. He had bad breath. Um, and either why, way, why she, is she dressed like Popeye in that scene? Like she's not a sailor. She's not in the Navy. She's a right. stripper. What are you doing in a Navy outfit? And also, how did they find outfits for her on the boat? Because she changes outfits a couple of times, but she was yeah. like five. Five two with different measurements than yeah. everyone else on the boat. I, I was always different. concerned about that. Uh, the Vincent Chase Award for Are We Sure This Character Was Actually Good at His Job? Hey, Gary Busey, a.k.a. what's his name? Lieutenant Krill? Krill, great name. Maybe just take Seagal out. If you're going to kill all these people with the uh, fake rock concert and you're just going to murder 10 people, including the captain, maybe have somebody down there just to open the door to shoot Seagal. Mm-hmm. Why? Why? You know he's a Navy SEAL. Why not? Let, why are you letting him hang around? I would also put. Are we good at their? Sure, they're good at their job. Can Ryback cook? Like, is, is he any good? And I had this under unanswerable questions, Bill. Do you think Steven Seagal can cook? Because, I, like, I know I, he can eat. It's so like, funny. I had a, I had the same exact thing written down. Um. So De Niro gets. Well, I had this part. I had was K- six months. Was Casey Ryback a good cook? Yeah, you and go. then was Steven Seagal a good cook? We we don't ever actually see him cooking. He's talking about how he made this bouillie base. By the way, like mm-hmm. if you came over for football on Sunday and you're like, "What are you making?" I'd be like, "Been working on this bouillie base." You'd be like, "What's going on?" <laughs> you lost your mind. Yeah, the sailors are like, "Hey, Case, what's for dinner tonight? Chicken wings, steak, ribs. I got fifty gallons of bouillie base. What? <laughs> how about just go to the grill, buddy? <laughs> Can he just make pasta by the tons?" <laughs> yeah. Um, the Butch's Girlfriend Award for Weak Link of the Film. I mean, we just got to address it. It's a June 1989 play-by-play maid who jumps out of a cake and who also accidentally drugged herself, it seems like. And within a half hour, she's part of a counter-military coup Mm. and um, really pulling it off. Like, I I feel like better than I would in the same situation. Definitely pulls it off. Very clutch for a a play-by-play maid. A couple things on that. One, it's Christmas time right now. A lot of people are watching Home Alone. The magazine that they have on deck of her that's in it, it's the same issue of Playboy that Kevin finds in wow. Buzz's little chest. Same exact issue. Uh, that's my catalog of it. But here's the weak link of the film. All right, so we've talked about this a little bit, Bill. In the basketball sense, Seagal starts, he hits two or three from the field, and then they sit him down for the rest of the first quarter, for the entire second quarter, and he doesn't come back in until after halftime. It really bothered me on the rewatch how long he was in that refrigerator. You watch the movie, you want to see Seagal kick some ass. He is on the bench for a long time in this movie, and I think it hurts the movie a little bit. That's a good one, because in Air Force One, Harrison Ford, he, they don't realize he's in like the cargo section yeah. or whatever, but we, we're still with Harrison Ford and it's like, hey, go down there. And then he kills that guy. And it's like five minutes later, hey, go down there and does it again. So we, he's, he's, he stays in, he gets his shots off. I like that. That's good. Danny McBride Award. We never get to give this out. The Danny McBride Award for playing yourself. George and Barbara Bush. Great to see them. Yeah. Just out of nowhere. The Prez from 92. Uh, I don't know how they got the footage. I don't know why the White House was like, sure. You you used the footage of George Barber. What's the movie for- about? Well, it's Steven Seagal and a playmate, and they're going to shoot nukes at Hawaii. I love it. <laughs> That's good. You want Dick Sign Cheney too? Because he's in it. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> What's age the worst? You mentioned all the Seagal stuff. Um, the era of gratuitous action movie nudity, I would say it's probably aged badly. It was very important yes. to the 80s and early 90s. Where do you stand on the name Casey Ryback for our hero? Like Casey Ryback sounds like, let's go down the sidelines where Casey Ryback's with Doug Peterson. Is that, is that like the a name of a reporter? <laughs> yeah. Is that the name of, of, uh, of somebody who's like our Navy SEAL chef? Yes. Casey Ryback works with Evan Washburn and Melanie Collins, and they're going to get Pete Carroll on the run game before they go to halftime and do great work on it and send it back to the booth. Right. That's so funny. Casey Ryback. It's a, it's a sideline reporter, and they're great. Captain Adams, mm-hmm. the guy who plays him at the beginning, who's Seagal's protector. Yep. 
when he's actually dead after Busey kills him versus when he's alive. Can't really tell the difference. Not sure what was going on with that actor, but he died of natural causes two years later. I had he died in 1994. The, uh, I had him for the underacting award for being worst dead guy acting ever. Not good. If you look <laughs> right. closely, uh... you can see him breathe. You can see him blink. <laughs> And you had to feel for the director. We got this old guy on the floor. He's uncomfortable. Yeah. It's a liability. Like the, the the DP is like, he's still blinking. We can see it. Yeah. Like, ah, can you can we get one? Can you stop blinking? It, it must be frustrating. But you can see him move. They shot him twice in the chest. He pull, he pulls out a cigarette at one point. <laughs> um, more what stage the worst? High ranking government officials smoking indoors during big meetings. Oh, yeah. a big that that oily kind of villain in this semi villain. He's mm -hmm. like, always has the cigarette Constantly. going. We mentioned the obvious Tommy Lee body double right before he dies. What else do you have for what stage is the worst? Uh, listen, we covered most of mine. The the uh, Here's one move on the deck. Seagal's aged terribly. You know, you, you did a drive-by in Busey, which is kind of what it deserves. I just, it, for us, my age, your age, whatever, Busey was really a thing. And it started for me in Lethal Weapon with yep. the Mr. Joshua character and how he fights Mel Gibson on the lawn. And he was just like, when Busey was in a movie, you didn't fuck around and you paid attention to him. And he's Angelo Pappas and Point Break and he's charismatic as hell. And now like for the Instagram and the TikTokers, he's just like this, I don't know, weird old guy who's lost his marbles and says dumb stuff. I liked him in the day a lot. Me too. It's a great one. Was there a better title for this movie? Uh, we mentioned Dreadnought. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of weird research about this where the marketing department wanted a three-word title because that had worked with the other four Seagal movies. So they came up with Last to Surrender. That sucks. And in the research, Seagal was furious <laughs> and fired off a harshly worded letter to the executives saying he wouldn't stand for another three-word title. And they eventually settled on Under Siege. Last to Surrender, I, I, I'm not against... Maybe later in the Seagal catalog, but not for this movie. The, the Seagal titles, as long as they abide by one rule, which is in the trailer, as the guy's doing the voiceover, it has to end with Steven Seagal is under siege, marked right. for death, out for just. As long as it does that, that's, I'm fine with it. It doesn't need so to be last three to words. surrender kind of qualifies. It's not it bad. has to be the last to surrender. So now we're Steven splitting Seagal is. It's all right. The last to surrender. The last to surrender. It works. Best quote, I do have 50 gallons of bouillabaisse that I could prepare for tomorrow. Just out of nowhere. Wait, 50 gallons of bouillabaisse? <laughs> you know how much that is? That's like an incredible amount of bouillabaisse. A lot of, a lot of sailors on that ship. Anytime you describe food by, like, by gallons, it sounds disgusting. I'm thinking of mayonnaise yeah, or something. Disgusting. All right. The Stephen A. Smith Hottest Take Award. Do you have you one? Because I have one. I, I certainly do. Who should go first? You go. I'll get uh, you have the floor. All right. So we got all this collector collection of actors who are in this movie who went on to go and be in the fugitive, including the director. And bearing in mind that the Stephen A. Smith hottest take is not just a clever take, it's something completely fucking outlandish. You don't even know if the guy believes. There's one person missing from the under siege fugitive pipeline. Yeah, And my take is The Fugitive would have been a better movie if Steven Seagal played Dr. Richard Kimball. That's my take. If you bring everybody back <laughs> and let me sell it. Let me sell it, Simmons. Uh, <laughs> listen, you're going to have to dial up the action a little bit. The Fugitive has two fight scenes with fist fighting that Seagal would kill. And who better to fight the guy who breaks people's arms than a one-armed man who lost it in the line of duty? And can you just imagine, Bill, when Seagal walks in as Dr. Richard Kimball in the middle of Charles Nichols' presentation, and he sits there and he goes, hey, anybody seen Richie switch the samples? <laughs> anybody know why Devlin McGregor did Lentz? I'm gonna keep coming back here so somebody remembers Nichols falsifying his research. And then they fight, and I think it works, and I love it. I want Seagal as Dr. Richard Kimball. That's my take. They should have made The Fugitive with Harrison Ford, but then simultaneously <laughs> snuck some Seagal scenes in as a different movie. That's a great one. You know, you were I thought you were going to say Joey Pants should have played the third guy who was played by Cole Meany. Yeah, yeah. And yep. you could have, because Joey Pants, big fugitive thing, but you could have had him and then that would have had the pipeline too. I have a much simpler, hottest take. Let's go. Not as good as yours. <laughs> I think Tommy Lee plays the exact same guy in Under Siege and The Fugitive. 
I think all it's right. the exact same character. There's no difference between them. He's doing all of the same things. It's just one guy has good intentions and the other guy has bad intentions. So he wins the Oscar for The Fugitive and you think the performance is just as good or, or just the same in Under Siege? I think Siege? it's the same everything. He mm -hmm. just, his hair is different and he's got malicious intent. In the Fugitive, same thing. He, the way he like tries to have charisma and he right. lowers his voice and rises it again. And the way he uses his physicality, um, the way he has like people around that he's like connected to at all times, yeah. even I, I just think it's 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 the same. If you would have put Deputy Samuel Gerard in the aviators and the bandana and the leather jacket and a donut with some of little sprinkles on top, it really does look the same way. It's true. It's the same yeah. cadence and the same tone. It's true. No casting what ifs for this, other than Seagal almost wasn't in it. The Ruffalo Hannah Rubinek Partridge overacting word. He, uh, Gary Busey just lock it down. It's done. It's <laughs> over and over again. He's dialing it up. Best that guy is the hardest we've had in a while. It's a lot. You mentioned the people from The Fugitive, including uh, Private Nash. Yep. Who is ponytail guy in The Fugitive? Who's mm -hmm. I, I'm not going to say he's a strong actor. <laughs> I, I I don't know if he goes in what stage the worst or picking nits, but uh, that guy that guy is not Pacino in Godfather One. You have the redheaded guy from Twenty Four. Yep, Glenn Morshower. Love him. He's in this. Nick Mancuso's of that guy. Cole Cole Meany is basically that guy. And mm -hmm. then from the fugitive standpoint, the guy who escapes the train crash. Copeland? He's in this. Yeah. And then who else was in there from the fugitive? All right, so you got one of my favorite guys in the fugitive. He's Rosetti. And he's the guy who's interrogating uh, he's, uh, Dr. Kimball about what color were his eyes? Are you the, oh, the yeah. sole beneficiary? He's like the most Chicago guy ever. He's played yeah. by Joe Casala and he gets yeah. shot in the thigh by the guy serving hors d'oeuvres. Oh, that's a good one. Well, there's one more and I think he's the winner. I hope you have the same one as me because I have a definite winner. I think we're oh, there's have the a definite one. winner. I forgot to mention blood in blood out guy who is played <laughs> by Damian Chapa who uh, also went on to to be a bad guy in Melrose Place. Enjoy that guy. But I, I love Blood In, Blood Out, so I, to me, he's Damien Chapa. Um, that guy from the program. Yes! We got it. Alvin Mack. We got played it. Played by Dwayne Davis. This was Dwayne Davis' season with The Fugitive. Good. I mean, I'm sorry, Under Siege in the program. I don't know what else he was in, but Alvin Mack. I, we, you, one of the first ones you ever did with us was The Program. Yep, you, me, and Rosillo, and we're just Alvin Mack watching film. Eagle zip a hero, unless the setback shifts into the eye. So he's in that as Alvin Mack. He's in the movie Necessary Roughness as Featherstone. And then in Beetlejuice, he has a small part in the underworld as a football player. Dwayne mm. Davis as one of the great football characters, the most heartbreaking stories, Alvin Mack. That's definitely the guy I'm so happy. Who do you have for Dion Waiters for best heat check? All right. so. There's the usual suspects for this. Do you know the guy in the war room? I laugh out loud when this part happens. When they're freaking out and the nervous guy goes, what's going to happen if these missiles hit Honolulu? And this one soldier goes, approximately 1 million people will reach 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit in less than a second. And it's like, Jesus, lighten up, Francis. It is a crazy line read. And on the strength of that one line alone, I want to submit that guy for Dion Waiters, which is one shot. I like it. It, it, it. The opposite of Dan Waiters is the old guy who died and then couldn't even stay dead as he <laughs> as he was dying. Um, yeah, that's good. I kind of like the the guy who doesn't tell us for an hour that Seagal is a real badass. But I don't like. Does Erica Liniac? She's in this too much. Too much. Too much. Um, I don't even know who Dion Waiters is for this. This is a tough one. Hey, let's go with your guy. All I'm right, fine with that it. guy. Nails it. Recasting couch. Yeah. I already did mine, Joey Pants, uh, as that third party. And then we have more fugitive DNA. I'm just gonna thought experiment you with. I you you made the case for Busey. We talked about him. He's yeah, great. Give me something. It's a pretty white movie. It is. We are in early, he's available, kind of underrated mode. You going with, with the big Sam dog? Samuel L. Jackson. Ah. Okay. In the Busey part, it's a slightly different movie, but I might like it more. 
because we're getting like a really we're buying we're buying young on Sam Jackson. We're getting we're 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 going super early with him. We're we're a little like James Cook's James Cook on the Buffalo Bills right now, Definitely. kind of version of Sam Jackson. Like, holy shit, he's third in all purpose purpose yards. Sam Jackson? I had no idea. So I I, I don't know. I I don't mind it. He's just a cook, motherfucker. It, 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 it would work. And you know what? I guarantee we're not getting that scene where he dresses up like a woman. I, I don't think Sam Jackson. No, he's he's telling that. somebody else to do that. That's no out. I like Sam Jackson for sure in that role. Young. FS Internet Research, real yeah. quick. Um, Erica Leniak's first feature film role was at age 12. She was the girl Elliot kissed in E.T., the extraterrestrial. It's amazing. They did not shoot on the real U.S. Missouri. They used USS Alabama. And uh, a lot of this was shot at uh, in Mobile, Alabama, and they made the ocean seem like mm. it was way more vast than what they were actually working with. And that was how they saved some money. Um, the, the writer who wrote the movie Lawton said, said uh, we're trying to make Seagal more mainstream, getting him out of the pure action genre and into an acting role. And said that originally everything was getting blown up and it was going to be $100 million to make and now it's 30 million. And then he says, it was Steven's idea to fit the Pearl Harbor Memorial into the film because all these incredible ships would be there, a spectacular sight. I love, Seagal is so powerful at this point that people are like trying to kiss his ass with quotes from that era. It's, it's really amazing. All right, so here's why this movie is even more important than I realized before I did the research. Harrison Ford was on the fence with taking The Fugitive. Okay. They sent him a rough cut of Under Siege to see if he wanted to work with Andrew Davis because they're already giving it to Andrew Davis. Ford was so impressed. He's like, I'm in. Richard Kimball. No done. kidding. Yeah. I wonder how long he watched the rough cut. Did he, did he make it through the whole thing? Did he make it till uh, our girl jumps out of the cake and say, I'm in? I don't know how Harry <laughs> Ford rolls. <laughs> the cake. Yeah. He was probably high. He probably didn't know what was going yeah, on. Yeah, maybe so. And then uh, they had a blackout barge with uh, with Alabama that you can sure. read the research if you want. But they had to basically block out Alabama in all these different ways with a green screen so that uh -huh. you couldn't see it in some of the shots. So there you go. Apex Mountain. I think this is it for Seagal. I, yeah. think, I think Under Siege is the one. Well, it's a true apex in that he definitely goes down after. It's a steady yeah. climb and... He reached the top of the mountain as a hundred million dollar movie, and he's the lead, and he's real, and it's he's respected. And then he just blew it, and it's it was hubris of I'm going to do on deadly ground. And then he did some other nonsense, and it was it was over quickly, wasn't it? Once he got yeah. there, I think we know this was Apex Mountain because they were like, we are so desperate for you to do Under Siege Two, we'll let you direct on deadly yeah. ground, even though you have no directing credentials whatsoever, like none. Mm -mm. Tommy Lee Jones, no, but mm -mm, we're we're getting yet. closer. Busey, what is the Busey Apex Mountain? Is it Point Break? Well, or, got, or would you go back to Buddy Holly's story when he when he gets nominated for the Oscar? I think that's the rock star moment. But in terms of banking him in huge movies and probably paying him a good salary, look, he has like two scenes in in the firm, but he's really good in those scenes. Yeah. So he had the firm, he had Point Break, he had this. We're right there. It's 91, Lethal 92. Yeah. Lethal Weapon, 87. It's, it's hit a five-year run, and then it was just went to, to jokes. Bernie Casey, no way. It's Revenge mm -hmm. in the Nerds. Lambda, Lambda, Lambda. Um, boat movies. Titanic, think, probably? Yeah. Titanic in 97, yes. Erica Liniak? I'm gonna say yes. Hell yes, Erica. This Leniak, is the one. Yes. This is the one that kept her going forever. Hey, Bill, if we if we checked in on Erica Leniak, what, what's is she got everything together? Is she all right? I I saw a video where she appeared to have a lot of tattoos, which is fine. But I, I just wonder how she's doing these days. I worry. I I see those pictures of like Yasmin Bleeth these days, and it, it, I don't know. It's changed a lot's changed. I hope she's doing okay. I like her work. I'm just gonna say that I intentionally avoided this subject. But she, re she resurfaced in the 2000s after mm. some issues okay. and she was in Celebrity Fit Club and oh. during that reality, like, let's bring people from the 80s, sure. 90s. And uh, I, don't, I don't think it's gone awesome, was, was the feeling right. I was getting. Usually doesn't. 1989 Playboy issues? I'm going to say this was Apex Mountain. 
Well, I mean, other than the Home Alone thing, Home Alone, yeah. is that the every combo single of those two, yeah. that, that issue may be the, one of the most famous issues ever now. So Voodoo Chow. Yeah. I think it's NWO. I don't think it's Under Siege, even though it's such an important part of Under Siege and this mm -hmm. movie made a shitload of money. But I mean, it carried wrestling for two years. It's hard for me to believe that it's not the answer. I'm thinking of Jimi Hendrix mu music in movies because we oh. had Foxy Lady in Wayne's World right around the same era. And oh, it yeah. up a few places. He was big. Oh, I like that. Any other Apex Mount for you? What about movie cooks? bill like movie movie cooks. chefs like fictional cooks um so we got casey ryback and you got you know ratatouille that the kids are into i gotta throw out our guy paulie slicing the garlic very thin and liquefying the pan with just a little oil it's a very good system i think that's my favorite one but paulie can't kick ass like ryback is anybody else am i missing anybody else i mean the julia childs but that's a real person you talking about Clemenza? Who? Polly Polly from No, Polly from Goodfellas. Oh, Polly from Goodfellas. Yeah. I, I was thinking Clemenza in The Godfather making the meatballs. No, I mean they slicing the garlic Pauly, in the Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah, I got you. Yeah. I got my, my Italian favorite. movies confused. That's sure. pretty good. It's a good list. And Ryback's up there with his bula base and his knives. <laughs> so we wouldn't go Favreau and and Chef or Bradley Cooper and Burnt, no, all those are out because I don't think any of those people could fight. Yeah, I, I've never seen that Aaron Eckhart, Zeta Jones movie, No Reservations. They, they ain't mm. lasting on the battleship either. I need someone who can cook and fight. I'll go Ryback. I, I love Clemenza. I might go Clemenza. Okay. Why don't you tell that girl you love her? <laughs> Picking nits. Yeah. I, I mean, how did an armed group of disgruntled military people mm -hmm have firepower and just get on a boat 20 mm -hmm. strong with that had all these missiles and torpedoes on it. What, ha what's going on here? Mm -hmm. I don't have anything else to add. I, Liz, there's a lot of things. First of all, a surprise party is the corniest, flimsiest nonsense cover. Like that's something that you do at like Dunder Mifflin. <laughs> yeah. They have a battleship that has nuclear warheads on it and they're out at sea and they're saying, it's a surprise party. Don't tell anyone. Don't, right. like, Don't tell the captain. Nonsense. Well, right. also, one girl you're bringing? Yeah. You spend all this money, you're flying people in on a plane. Like, how about six girls? Yeah. Like, are, are we partying or not? Why one? That doesn't make sense. The military haircuts, I don't understand at all. Go on. Are we in the military or are we not? Like, yeah, we are. I always thought people had shaved heads and crew mm -hmm. cuts and not seeing that there. Um, Cole Meany, who I've never been a huge fan of, but he's an Irish actor. He makes a role at the American accent early and then gives up and he's Irish for his last like five scenes. I don't know what, what's going on. It's a little costnery. I think of Cole Meany, I think of him in Con Air and this. He has a very Mystery small Alaska. part in Die Hard 2, Mystery Alaska. But the accent comes and goes. It, it is the the uh, Prince of Thieves, Costner, and other rewatchables I enjoyed. But it just if you're going to do it, just do it the whole time. God damn. Yeah. I know the shoot's stick with long. It. You got to stick with it. We mentioned Erica Liniak jumping out of a cake. With the whole thing was weird. The cake, like, she's asleep in the cake, but he, he pushes the cake, and then the lights go on, so she just jumps out yeah. and doesn't realize anybody's there. She just didn't hear any gunfire. Um, I'm just not sure what's going on with that. I don't know why she's there or how she got there, but here's a point of question, Bill. I saw this differently when I was when I was younger. Does does Busey roofie her? What what is going on with the pills? Because she comes on, she says, I'm seasick, and he goes, Here, take these pills. They're good for seasickness. And then she like takes a bunch and sleeps, but then I'm like, I think she takes too many. I think the because she takes like five of them. He I tells her to take two to take one. and she takes yeah. like six. So Busey yeah. does not do anything underhanded because he's a sociopath. Like he no. doesn't give her something to knock her out like intentionally. I'm, I hope no. not, but I mean, he okay, did good. try to drown 300 people in the yes. bottom of the boat. So it can't be ruled out, but yeah. And Busey's like really handsy with her on the way in. He's holding yeah, her hand, tough. his hands on her back. I just don't like it. So I thought maybe he would have gone for it, but I'm, I'm glad to hear not. Seagal gets hurt in the water and then it You're seems right. like he's really hurt, and then he's fine. Like the next scene, I don't. I, mean, they, I don't know if they abandoned it or they forgot. I thought that was weird. And then, um, 
this is a super nitpick. This came up in the research. He's he's taking pies in the oven. The pies burn. He tells uh-huh. he tells the idiot who's protecting the thing, like, you know, right. hey, you got to take my pies out of the oven. <laughs> um, the U.S. Navy does not use propane natural gas ovens because oh. they have weapons on the boat, so they use electric appliances. When they I come. love that stuff. Great yeah. nitpick. So there you go. What else do you Great have? Nitpick. Um, I, we talked about the final line is terrible surprise party microwave. I, I, that's pretty much it. I, I don't know what role the stripper played. Bill, let me ask you a question. Unanswerable. She says her agent set her up for that. How much do you think Jordan got paid to go and jump out of the cake in nineteen? Oh, I think a lot. Hours? I think it's I think like when people get like Fleetwood Mac to play rich guys like for their birthday party. I think she think probably got like twenty like k. Yeah, twenty thousand. Yeah, that's a good check. Yeah, I think or ten k, maybe ten k back then. I think 10, she got overpaid. Bucks. I wonder if she ever got paid. Probably they, not. I think they had 10K to spend and they're like, should we get 10 girls for a thousand or should we get June 1989 <laughs> for 10? It's a great one. Wouldn't you go two for 5,000? No, yeah, they said, I, no. Let's get Jordan <laughs> okay, Let's go all in. <laughs> great. <laughs> Sequel, prequel, prestige TV, all black cast are untouchable. This is an untouchable. Mm, it's good. I don't know what this would look like as a prestige TV show and I don't want to find out. Is this movie better with Wayne Jenkins, Danny Trejo, Catherine Hahn, Steve Buscemi, Sam Jackson, JT Welsh, Byron May, or Philip Baker Hall? I already mentioned Sam Jackson. I think Philip Baker Hall as the captain would have been a huge improvement, right? It would have been a huge improvement. And I answer this question the same way every way. Philip Baker Hall in the role of Flo- Floyd, in the role of Floyd Gondoli, just <laughs> right. saying, listen, I know you don't like Ryback, but I like butter in my ass. <laughs> I like people on film fucking. That, that, that's just me. I like lollipops in my mouth. I think he's a great captain. Jack, Boulia Bays is the future. <laughs> <laughs> we got the talent. Oh, I love Floyd. Just want to ask her who gets it. It's got to be Tommy Lee. Yeah. Was Casey Radbeck actually a good cook for probably unanswerable questions? We tried to answer this. I, I still don't know. Did Seagal need a ponytail? I have for unanswerable. I like he him. Found, he leaned on it, but did he, did he need it? Because he didn't have it in this movie and he's fine. I look at it like this. Like, Tom Selleck doesn't always have to have the mustache, but when he doesn't, you're like, what the fuck, Tom? Like, we're here for yeah. the mustache. Good point. Give us the ponytail. That's what we're here for. Good point. Seagal, worst body of any action hero ever. We didn't really hit this hard. Um, yeah. It looked like he had worked out, but his arms were about as big as mine anyway. And he has a weird, he's tall and he's got this weird below the nipples torso uh-huh. situation. Like his, he's got a, like a thick torso, but no arms. So there's really... They put him in a tank top for a while to try to like to see. It's like a baggy tank top too. I know. I don't, know I don't what really that know what the right is. outfit is for him. It's something big and baggy, you know, like he, and it's black. Like when he's in yeah. his ass kicking out for just the stuff, he's wearing sort of loose baggy stuff. He has a square like torso, which means he has no V shape at all, like the classic Schwarzenegger. But I got to give him credit. We started the show by saying C minus. He he obviously had been lifting weights with his arms, but the rest of his body, it's just not, he's, he's never going to have it. It's all about the yeah. face for him. He just doesn't have it. Which makes it so funny that he is 120 and 0 in fights in five action movies. <laughs> with no punches in. His compu box punch stats are just, he's completely demolishing anyone. <laughs> yeah, I think my wife and I always have a joke about weird bodies. Yeah. And I think Seagal had a weird body. He did. I just like a one of a kind weirdo body. Best double feature choice of this movie, probably The Fugitive, right? Yeah, you would watch one before the other, and it's like this is how The Fugitive came to be. Yeah, I, I wrote down a movie that I I refuse to not stand up for. I like I like U five seven one. I like it. It's McConaughey. Oh, it's wow. a nice Bill Paxton performance, and we're out at sea again. U five seven one. Interesting. I also would vote the package too if you want to see kind of the prequel to this with it's Andrew good, huh? Davis, but that it's a strong one. In Code of Silence, I, I don't feel like you're on it enough with Code of Silence. Don't know I could it. kind of tell. Chicago, 1985, no interest? No, I know the other one you mentioned, the other Chuck Norris, The Silent Rage. Like well, that's, that's the one I mean, where the villain doesn't talk. I love that movie. Yeah, that's a great one. Code of Silence, give it a whirl. All right. What do you have for the Indian Red Zawane Award for what happened the next day? Nothing good. I, I think I think Casey and Jordan probably went to Hawaii and uh, they went to a bar and had a few Mai Tais and he did some dipshit guitar playing and then they went back to a hotel and he forced himself on her. It, it's, it's it's probably not good <laughs> at all. But that's I'm where going it in a different direction. <laughs> what do you got? I think they they kind of she goes to LA, loses okay. touch with Casey. 
But the acting career doesn't go great. And at some point she needs money and circles back with Casey. And it's like, hey, do you guys want to get, do you want to get together? I'm going to be, right. you know, where, and he's like, uh, I'm in Panama right now. I, I can't. And then uh, she ends up basically getting all the roles that Shannon Tweed turns down in all oh. the Skinamax movies for the mid, late nineties. I think that's her, that's where it ends up for her. And that would be perfect because she doesn't date musicians, but she would end up with Gene Simmons instead of Shannon Tweed. So that'd be 100%. perfect. I like it. I actually, I, I had this in Unanswerables and I forgot to ask. I, I actually thought she was a pretty good actress. Get into I think it. How for come? how these, how that role goes in movies like this, yeah. I think she, like compared to the lady in Bloodsport, for instance. The, the reporter, reporter in Bloodsport or is, in She's Kelly probably LeBron a one or a two. Terrible, terrible. Um, I think she's like at least a seven or an eight as like the eye candy. I have to have some chemistry with the hero. I have to do some stuff. She's pretty good. She has a legitimate crying scene that is believable when he's first explaining to her. And like, I, I think she's good. I, I, any problems with the movie aren't really about her. She's, she's just fine. She's good. What piece of memorabilia would you want from this movie? I mailed it to you. I would want that. I would want the under siege menu, the ride back menu. And I would just want the ability to just put that on a wall somewhere in my house. Well, I'm looking at you right now, and you got the white shadow and Patriots helmets, basketball hall of fame. Imagine if you could pod with the Ryback <laughs> menu from under siege behind you. God, that'd be so cool. I'm going to look yeah. for it online. I'm going to get it for you for Christmas. I'll find it. It definitely blew up on the boat. <laughs> what do you have? It, what was your memorabilia? Really? You didn't say. I, I would do the, I, I would just go with like the, um, the aviators, sunglasses that Tommy Lee wears and the mm. jacket, the whole thing. If you did a tandem Halloween costume where you dressed up like that, and your friend dressed up in a stupid chef's hat, and you were like, we're from under siege. There's like one guy at the party who would get it. <laughs> but, but they think it's amazing. Yeah. yeah. They they think you guys amazing. are awesome. <laughs> yeah. That's like when I went as Billy Hicks from St. Elmo's Fire, and my wife went as the Demi Moore character one year. And I would say like seven or eight people got it, and everyone else blank stares. Oh my God, that's I had great. a fake saxophone, I uh -huh. had a wig on, it was great. Can I tell you, Billy, this is perfect. This Halloween, you know what my wife and I were for Halloween? We were Todd and Margot from Christmas Vacation. Wow. And we had the silver suits and the slicked hair, and we both had huge bottles of Evian, and people lost their mind. They're like, people the best love that costume movie. ever. We, we just nailed it. When you nail the movie costume, it's unlike any other. You think that's the number one Christmas movie, or are you going somewhere else? Number one, that's my movie. I watch it only on Christmas Eve. And I'm such a nerd for rewatchables. That episode dropped and I'm saving it to listen to like as I drink on Christmas oh, that's Eve great. on my couch. I'm, and how did it go? I, it's you and it Van great. and CR. Yeah, we had four. Fantasy. It was great. It was okay, great. good. Coach Finstock Award for Best Life Lesson. Don't, do don't, don't underestimate the cook. It's a great call. Especially on, a, on a, some sort of military. The cook's going to have a background. Just don't think he's a pushover. It's not, it's not the five, seven guy from the bear who's now playing <laughs> Carrie Von Eric for some reason. Yeah. It's not that guy. Uh, it's, it's the, the guy might have, might know how to do some stuff. Don't just put him in a locker and think you're just going to get away with it. You know, in the season finale of, of the bear season two, Carmi gets locked in the fridge. Oh, that's true. He does. Right. right? <laughs> and everyone's probably so, like, oh, they're, they're, they're taking it from Kubrick. I'm like, no, no, no. They're taking it from yeah, under siege. You guys, under siege, baby. they know what time it is. That's fantastic. Who won the movie? I got uh, Tommy Lee Jones. Tommy Lee Jones got his role in The Fugitive from this. He got the Oscar, and he is still to this day, uh, I think, doing insurance commercials where he probably gets $2 million for an hour's work. So I think it would be Tommy Lee Jones. And he played the same character in both movies. Well, You're this part's right. exciting. I'm going to tell a little story as we bring Craig on for his All take. Right. So I told Craig, we're going to run this on Sunday, Christmas Eve, because Sal and I are going to do our podcast on Monday. And I said, we're going to go with a big one. And Craig, I think Craig got excited and thought we were actually going with a big one in his mind. And he's <laughs> like, oh, what is it? And I was like, under siege. And Craig was like, what? And I was like, under siege. It's the best Seagal movie. And he was yeah. like, that's a big one? And I was like, you haven't seen under siege? And he said, no. And I'm like, Craig, you're going to see it and you will understand why it's a big one. So Craig, what was your take? I do understand. I love this movie. I just got to say, you guys are really, you guys keep delivering. You guys really do. The last <laughs> four you, movies, I genuinely have never heard of. Cliffhanger, you, Sudden Death, Toy Soldiers, and Under Siege. All of them hit. Yeah. <laughs> Remarkable that these movies are pulling through. And what's great about them is all these movies, 
they're always like the premise that all the major actors and directors passed on because it's too ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's why they're so good. It's like a group of children take down a terrorist organization at a boarding school. Everyone's like, yeah, pass. Uh, a terrorist, uh, you know, holding the vice president hostage at the Stanley Cup. It's like, all right, pass. <laughs> a chef and a stripper taking down terrorists on a boat. It's like, all right, pass. Uh, but I love it. And it, it's, you know, it's a bummer now is that like, we don't have the like, we don't have the like cheesy weird actors anymore that like you want to go see because they're super weird. Like we were just mm-hmm. talking about National Lampoons, like the Randy Quaid's, yeah. Seagal, Gary Busey. Like yeah. that stuff doesn't exist anymore. Like if you make a silly action movie, it still just has like The Rock or Jason Statham in it now. I think it. I think we've all gotten too self aware. But I'll be honest. I think there's there's possibilities of Travis Kelsey here. Oh. <laughs> Tommy Alter, my friend Tommy Alter, who used to work with us at The Ringer, was the first person to mention me after to- after Travis hosted SNL. And Tommy mm-hmm. went. Okay. And he texted me the next day and he's like, Travis is going to be the next big action movie star. And I'm like, whoa. Like, I didn't realize it was Hottest Take Sunday. But the more I look at it and like the kind of fame he has. Yeah. It's a little like what happened with Howie Long when Howie Long was in Broken Arrow as one of the bad guys. And it mm-hmm. made sense because Howie Long, but t- Travis is way more famous than Howie Long was. But mm-hmm. maybe Travis brings it back. Mm-hmm. He definitely has the perfect level of really not being that great of an actor, but he has charisma. And, and that's kind of like the sweet spot. And he's spot. kind of fun to make fun of a little bit too. Like yeah. I, I, every every picture or video with him and Travis, with uh, Taylor Swift is hilarious for some reason. It's so awkward and weird. Now. And can yeah. do all the action. And listen, any movie that he puts out is going to make a ton of money because all the Taylor Swift fans will see it. And that's all the studios care about, that it makes money. I'm just trying to see if we can get a role for Jason Kelsey in there somewhere, if he could be like the villain or the funny best friend or something, because that'd be even better. Funny best friend would be amazing. See, Craig, these action heroes that we grew up with, they weren't really actors. Like Arnold no. was a bodybuilder. bodybuilder. Like yeah. Steven Seagal was a freaking karate coach. You know, Van Damme was martial artist. He, he was just a martial artist who yeah. had no idea how to act. I think we're looking at it the wrong way. We keep putting like Chris Evans and a Helmsworth brother, or, know. you know, and all these people who are these actors that we have history with, and we should be going outside the box and like what Ron Artest should be in an action movie. Like, let's just let's just go nuts. Draymond Green, maybe this is the Draymond <laughs> Green future. Oh. Well, the ones that are sitting right there with Draymond, I mean, the it's, how long until Logan Paul is in an action movie or Jake Paul, those two guys, I mean, they, they, those, they, they can do it. By the way, I would, if, if Netflix was like the new Logan Paul movie mm-hmm. and it's, it's basically Die Hard in a TikTok hype house, I'm like, mm-hmm. okay, twist my <laughs> arm, I'm watching. Shit, they're going to make that now. They Give me royalties. Yeah. But yeah, I think that's part of the problem is they is we we're just ass backwards with how we find our action heroes, Craig. I'm glad Craig, I'm glad if if I've had any role in your life, it's to make you appreciate <laughs> terrible good. action movies from the 80s and 90s. And this movie isn't even terrible. No. No, and all the other Seagal movies kind of blend together for me, but this one will now forever stand out. I will, well, I remember when we did Hard to Kill, a lot of the reaction I got online was great, now do Under Siege or we riot. Like they wanted it. Yeah. They wanted it and they got it. Yeah. The other thing from a rewatchable standpoint, this movie was was on, I think, for the next seven years after it came out. That's the other this thing was, is like movies now are just not in our face as much as they used to be. Like you guys mm-hmm. didn't have much of a choice. Under Siege was just on cable and there wasn't a ton of movies in theaters it. that were awesome action movies. Now it's like, it's just hidden on a streaming platform amongst a, a million other options. Even if there is an Under Siege out there, we probably don't know it. I don't, maybe it's like Pacific Rim and those types of movies. Extraction. Well, yeah. yeah. We talked about this with Den of Thieves because we did Den of Thieves pretty yeah. early on the rewatchables. It's only been out for a couple of years, but we just felt like it was a rewatchable. But the rewatchable mechanisms yeah. aren't the same because now people go to the streamers and you're just choosing to click on movies and starting from the beginning yeah. versus like just hopping in halfway through, which I, I think, so for action movies, that's been tough because I think Triple Frontier would have been one that yeah. would have in the 90s would have had this awesome TNT run. Totally. Yeah. Right? Well, you would never re-watch some Chris Hemsworth shoot him up on Netflix. You just watch it once. But with Under Siege, you bought it for 12 bucks. So it was on your shelf. Yeah. And so you would put it in over and over again. You don't re-watch stuff that you stream. You just watch hey, it once. You never have a choice. Like if, if you went on Netflix and there was only 10 things you were allowed to watch and yes. they chose it for you, yeah. I mean, you would end up watching whatever they gave you. Craig, do you think Seagal thought he was Italian? <laughs> uh, I, he kind of shifted into different personas throughout the movie. Um, 
I don't know though. Him, the Italian. Do Italians have ponytails? I'm half Italian. I don't. I feel like I don't see a lot of Italian. Well, the, ponytails. the guy from The Sopranos did that. Carmelo fell in love with Furio. Furio. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. a real like from Italy. Italians have those. And maybe that's my what roommate. Thought it was. My roommate in Charlestown, the mid '90s, Richard Girardi, aka Ricky who knew the guy named Big Al who got us the illegal cable box, which yeah. was a huge, <laughs> huge boon for the rewatchables. But he had the ponytail for a little while there. So mm -hmm. it, it, it's a, you, you really have to pull it off. You need a certain face. You can't have a big head. You can't have a big head with the ponytail. I feel like he would have gone with Italian dishes though for his character, right? He would Definitely. have been serving carbonara and bolognese. No, there was nothing like yeah, that. But there. Ryback is like, what nationality or what ethnicity is Ryback? Sideline reporter. Southern reporter. All right. 